Hey everybody, welcome to NCC Online. Glad you're here today. My name is Pastor Rob, and I wanted to start right away with a 516 update for Cuba. Many of you may know that we have a missions outreach to Cuba. We've been working with a group of Christians there. They call themselves Christo Centro International, CCI for short. And they have a new president, Pastor Luis, who is trying to get through COVID and, the, and very difficult political times. I've been trying to find out what their needs are over the last several months. It's been very difficult to get good communications there. If you watch the news, you know uh, Cuba has been in a, in a bit of a, almost a revolution going on there. COVID has hit them really hard. A lot of people have died. Uh, they've had uh, government suppression and so on. And so as a result, they have really tanked in their economy. They've, they've been through a lot of hardship and churches have mainly been shut down, but they're starting to open back up. They're hoping to open the, 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 the government's hoping to open up the, the whole country by November 15th. And so Luis is planning a trip that to visit 50 of the CCI pastors and their families personally and to encourage them. And so a lot of the needs were financial, practical, specifically food, clothing, and some local transportation like bicycles. And we were able to, just this week, we sent another gift because of your generous generous giving, especially at the Giving It All Away Christmas Eve offering. We were able to send a second generous offering of $10,000. And so that will go on this tour that Luis is planning to make and be used toward those practical things of food, clothing, clothing, and a few bicycles for the pastors and their families to get them through such a hardship so they continue to plant churches, preach the gospel, and lead people to Christ. So I'm really excited about that. Thank you, church, for your generosity. I hope that you continue to give generously for the causes of God and to, to obey his commands in tithing. We've been talking about win the day. This is a a uh, very practical series based on the book by Mark Batterson. Check out social media for a giveaway. I think we did a giveaway last Friday, possibly online. And uh, there are more to come as well as in-person giveaways. But if you don't feel like you're going to win, you could go and buy a book for yourself if you want to. The good news is a lot of what we've been preaching on is not in the book. This, these are just the topics we're using as springboards to get into the scripture and what does God teach about various topics. So we have looked at the first habit called flip the script. That has a lot to do with changing our stories. Of course, we change our story or have conversion only by the power of the Holy Spirit. We become men and women made new in Christ. We become new creatures. We become born all over again, Jesus says. And the way we do that is by believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ, trusting in his death, burial, and resurrection to take our sins away and to give us new life. Last week, we talked about kiss the wave. And this was, I felt, a very difficult message because many are struggling and we need to learn how, as Spurgeon put it, to kiss the wave of our suffering and tribulation and trial so that we can draw closer to Christ and, and be the people that he wants us to be. And today I want to talk about the third habit, which is eat the frog. Eat the frog. This is a practical and daily habit that we can put into practice that has to do with our work. Our approach to work is really important. We will spend a lot of hours in this life doing work, and that includes paid work and unpaid work. It includes work that you might call secular or spiritual or sacred either way it's all work and we should do it heartily and as unto the lord as we'll talk about today and so this is where we're going today and eat the frog is the specific habit that we'll talk about what does that look like and what does that mean so with that in mind would you join me with an opening word of prayer lord in heaven thank you for each one online right now meet their spiritual and physical needs and may each of us lean into your scripture now to see what you have to say and to put into practice these habits each week. And we ask in the name of King Jesus Christ. Amen. The way I want to approach Eat the Frog is by talking about three principles of work. And, and I'm doing this in a sort of onion layer approach, peeling off the three different layers, going from the very broad, the very big picture, and moving into the very specific. And so the first principle is the, the big picture. And that is this. God has given you and me work 
as a blessing, not a curse. He's given us work to do in this life as part of what it means to be a good human being. And it's meant to be purposeful. It's meant to be productive. It's meant to give us a happy life. It's not meant to be a curse. Now, if you've been around the church, you may have heard that work is a part of the curse. And this is theologically incorrect. And I want to show you that right now so that we can go further. Because if we get this wrong, we'll get the whole theology of work wrong. We'll we'll be doing it wrong all of our days. And even if you don't have a theology that's wrong, you may just have an experience that's been wrong, either because you were taught that work is a curse or that you've just experienced it that way. And once you experience some bad examples of work in your life, you start to look at it as a curse. Uh, Work is just something we got to do. You know, we go off to work and we we make our money and we come home. We punch the time clock and we can't wait till five o'clock so we can be done and do something fun. Maybe we're living for the weekend and and we just get through the drudgery of our jobs so that we can have a paycheck to, to have a good weekend on the boat or whatever. Or maybe we're just buying our time till we turn retirement age, 67 or whatever it is now, and I'm going to just go through this life and then get through it. Then I can retire and do what I want if I hope happen to make it that old. Well, that's not really a good way to live life. You think about all the hours we're spending working, again, paid and unpaid work. And if it's just a drudgery, if it's just part of the curse, then then a lot of our lives are going to be drudgery and a part of the curse. Now, we get this idea wrongly from Genesis 3.17 because back in Genesis we see that humans do fall into sin. Sin introduces death and we see the curse in our bodies as well as in this world. And that verse says this, God said to the man, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I command you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle Uh, to scratch a living from it. So he's saying to the original farmers, Adam and Eve, now that you've fallen into sin, your work is going to get harder because the ground's going to be cursed. You're going to have weeds. And we see this in every level of work. It's become harder. Our bodies decay now. Ultimately, we have death now. All as a result of the curse. But don't make any mistake about it. This verse isn't saying that your work is a curse. It's saying your work is going to be harder because of the curse. And there's a big, big difference. And the way I know it is back in Genesis 2.15. Here it says, The Lord placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. So everything that happens before the fall, everything that happens in the Garden of Eden is part of paradise. It's part of as God designed it. It's part of his beautiful design originally for humankind, man and woman. We're, we're given these perfect, these perfect lives to, to do God's will, and we, we were meant to live forever. And so part of it was work. And we see it right here. Before the fall, before sin, before the curse, comes this job. And in his case, he was to be sort of the original gardener to tend these uh, vegetables and, and so on and, and, and do this work. And it was very, very pleasurable, enjoyable, productive. It was a big part of uh, Adam and Eve's days and how they spent their time on, on the planet Earth. So I hope that right away we see from this principle a big shift in perspective that we should see our work not as a drudgery not as just a result of sin yes it's true that sin certainly makes it harder the curse has made a lot of it more difficult yes that's very true but at the core is a blessing from god and we can see our work as a blessing from God. It's a difference between the word occupation and vocation. Occupation comes from the word occupy, which means how we spend our time. Occupy is just like taking up space. I'm going to have an occupation, take up space, spend my time so that I can make some money and then be done with it. And that's one way to do it. But a better way is to think of your work as a vocation. Vocation comes from the word calling. And and we see in a spiritual side that God has called us to do specific work as he's gifted us. And we use that work to his glory. And this calling is important. And we can, no matter what it is that we're doing, from the very mundane to the very serious, we can use it 
and see it as a vocation as something we do for the glory of God. I have used this anecdote before, but I find it very, very helpful. There was a man who was laying bricks and another man walked by and saw him and he said, what are you doing? And the man said, what does it look like I'm doing? I'm laying bricks, I'm a bricklayer. He walked a little bit further and he saw another man laying bricks. And for some reason he asked the second man, well, what are you doing? This man looked up, had a big smile on his, on his face and he says, I'm building a cathedral. The difference there is the difference between occupation and vocation. They're both doing the same work. They're they're both doing very difficult manual labor. But the first guy saw it as just occupying time. I'm a bricklayer. I'm just laying bricks. The second person saw it with a spiritual context. I I know what I'm building. It's it's something very beautiful, and it's for the glory of God. It's going to be a great cathedral, and I can see the picture, and I'm called to do this. It's my purpose in life, and wow, will that ever keep you motivated and help you to finish your work and finish it for the long haul? Second principle, if it's true that work is a blessing, and it really is at its core. Doesn't Again, it doesn't mean it's easy, but it, but it means that God designed it for our benefit and for us to enjoy then we ought to work at it as hard as we can. We ought to do our best. And I think everybody knows the second one, but it's hard to do the second one without the first one. We, we are to work with all of our heart. That's what Colossians 3.23 literally says. It says, whatever work you do, church, do it with all your heart. Do it for the Lord and not for men. Now, there are many verses like this. This one is probably one of the most succinct and powerful, so that's why I chose it. But there are many verses that say, do your work the best that you can do it. And the, wor- the word work here is all kinds of work. Does it, again, not necessarily just paid. You might be a stay-at-home mom, and you feel like your work is never done, and you work harder than anyone you know, but you don't get paid. Well, God sees it, and we can work hard as a stay-at-home mom or stay-at-home parent for the Lord. And that's the key. We're doing it for the Lord, not even for these children, really. It's ultimately for the glory of God. Same thing is true whether you're in the business world or whether you're a YouTuber. That's actually a thing, and people actually make money from it, apparently. I'm doing something wrong. Uh, No matter what it is, you can do it for the glory of God, of course, within integrity, bounds. Now, the opposite of working hard, we know, is laziness. The Bible also talks a lot about laziness. Let me read you a key passage from Proverbs chapter 24. Here's what it says. I walked by the field of a lazy person, the vineyard of one with no common sense. I saw that it was overgrown with nettles. It was covered with weeds. So we see that's sort of a result of the fall. We already read this has weeds, but if you don't deal with it, it's going to be worse and unproductive. And its walls were broken down. Then as I looked and thought about it, I learned a lesson. A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. Big warning here. It's saying if we are lazy, we are going to reap the results of laziness. It's going to hurt our lives. It'll hurt our economy. It'll hurt our our homes. It'll be very unsatisfying. And specifically, I noticed in this proverb that it says, there's an evil cousin to laziness called procrastination. Procrastination is the habit of laziness. We want to have a habit of working hard. We want to have a habit, as we'll talk about, of of winning the day. We want to have a habit of eating the frog. But there's also a habit of procrastination. And if we're honest, a lot of us are mastering the art of procrastination. I know a lot of us would say that's true. Procrastination is the little bit of folding of the hands to rest. Well, I just put it off till later. Yeah, I know I have some farming out here to do and I got some weeding out here to do and I got to take care of the house, but the fence is falling down. That's sort of the context here in an agricultural situation in Bible times. But I just take a little nap. I'll do it later. And I, day after day after day, procrastination actually causes what then becomes laziness, which is the opposite of the principle of working and my whole life starts to feel that. Now, I want to call an elephant in the room. The elephant in the room is actually an elephant in most of our pockets right now. 
I asked on my Facebook page this week, what is a way that you waste time? And it, you can go look at it for yourself. Most of the answers were having to do with what we call a smartphone. And many people said scrolling through social media was their top one, that people look at YouTube videos and TikTok, and you can have hours just fly by doing those things. And people said games on their phone. And then there were some other answers too, like Netflix binging and some other things. But so much of it is bound up in technology, and almost all of them were things you could do on this little gadget. And we have to realize that as, as important as these devices are, we all have one, practically. Um, they're like having little powerful computer right there with you all the time and I do so many important things on this I'm so glad I have it I mean you got your Bible on there you got your finances on there you have your social media on there you have all these other apps that do important things but it also has become by far the number one way that we procrastinate and my question to you today is to be honest about that is to say who's controlling who is are you controlling your smartphone or is your smartphone controlling you? Because for many of us, it's taken over and it's no longer just about all those good uses that we have. It also is about sucking time. Now, is it wrong to, to, to have some downtime? Absolutely not. I actually think that's important and valuable and, and rest, rest is in the Bible, Sabbathing is in the Bible. But that's different from what God is warning us about in procrastination where we're just constantly using any bit of dead time to just put things off and, and to to float on our phones <coughs> uh, I, I read a new statistic this week that the average s smartphone user touches his or her phone 2,617 times a day now, I don't know who's counting that I don't know who's math but that sounds about right to me now that's just on average and a heavy user is actually touching their phone over 5,000 times every single day. And a lot of people, if they're honest, this is the elephant in the room, are heavy users of the phone. And I would invite you to say, maybe it's time to put some limits and boundaries, just as I might with my kids on my phone. You can self-govern. I'm going to have times where I put the do not disturb on. Yeah, I'm going to miss some important calls. That's going to be a side effect. But it's a better side effect than letting it rule my life. Maybe I'm going to have some times every day after 9 o'clock at night where it's shut down. Maybe I'm going to shut it down so it's not the first thing I look at when, it's, when I get out of bed a and so on. What, whatever you have to do to, to make sure you're controlling your phone. Ephesians 5, 15 to 16, important part of this principle. says, be careful, church, Christians, be careful how you live. Live as men, that's men and women, who are wise and not foolish that's the principle here and then the next verse and i don't have it on the screen says make the best use of your time these are sinful days so live as wise not as foolish and then it says make the best use of your time because the days are evil the word time in ephesians 5 16 is the biblical word kairos there's different words for time in the new testament in the greek kairos isn't just time the way we think of time, which is very linear, and we think of hours in a day, and how many hours did I work, and how many hours did I do this or that. This is time that means opportunity. So when it says make the most of your time, it's saying see time as opportunity. And the first part of the verse says make the most of your time is the word redeem. So you buy back the time, you make the most of every opportunity, you use your time well. So this isn't saying I ought to cram as much into my life as I possibly can in my short term time on earth. It's not saying I should be more busy. Here's some good news. In fact, most people are too busy. It's saying I actually ought to be smart and wise and a good steward of my time. I better make the most of my opportunity because the days are evil and God would want to use me in a, in a powerful way that's wise for my own family and for his purposes. And I do that by being very intentional and thoughtful about the time that I have and if I do that here's some cool side effect I actually get more free time because as I use my time in an intentional way I end up with more time and I can use that well as well so that's the first and second principle see work as a blessing not as a curse and if it is a blessing and it is the Bible teaches then we ought to work hard as for the Lord and not of the men and here's the third principle 
eat the frog. Now we get into a very good specific sort of time management 101. Uh, this is a principle I remember reading about it probably two decades ago, a little booklet called Eat the Frog. And my wife and I read that. I don't even remember why, but it was very helpful. And I've been using this principle ever since. In fact, it's probably been the top time management principle that I use in my life all this time. And it basically says take the worst thing you have to do, but the thing that has the most significance and value, the thing that you tend to procrastinate that takes time, and hit it right away, first thing you do. It comes from an old Mark Twain quote who said, if you, have to, if you ever have to eat a live frog, it's best done first thing in the morning. Now that sounds a little weird until you understand what he's saying. He doesn't actually eat live frogs. I hope you don't either. That would be weird. But to think of your frog as that thing that you like, you put it off, you procrastinate, it's hard. It's part of your God-given calling and mission on earth, though, and you know it, whether, again, that's child-rearing issues or whether it's uh, working on a sermon or whether it's uh, doing the, uh, you know, your spreadsheet that you that is part of your accounting or whatever it is, you say, I'm going to tackle that first. So for me, my frog is in my in my work day is sermon preparation now as a pastor i do of course i do many different things some people don't realize pastors do more than just sermons and we do uh and we don't just work for half an hour a week as some people think but we actually do some other things during the day but sermon prep takes the most time and that that takes a good chunk of my mornings and so if i put that off and if i don't sort of eat the frog each day, what I'll find is the week will start passing quickly with all these other things and demands and, and people issues. And all of a sudden, the sermon will be put to the end of the week. And now I'm just sort of hustling to get it done. And frankly, I would be shortchanging you, the person listening to the sermon, and shortchanging God, the person who wants me to preach the sermon, if I handle it that way. But instead, I've made it a habit Every Monday morning, I hit the ground running and make that my first and biggest priority. And then I block off several mornings every single week, Lord willing, to work on the sermon prep, to do the study, to do the prayer, to look at the passage, to, to see what God wants me to, to, to write, to put the sermon together, to practice the sermon, and do all of that in a way that I'm not at Saturday night and wondering, huh, I wonder uh, what should I preach on tomorrow morning? Now, that may sound funny, but I actually know guys who that happens to regularly that we in the ministry world, we call those Saturday night specials. And the, frankly, uh, you know, on a Sunday morning or online church, you know, if you're getting a Saturday night special, uh, you can tell. Now, I'm not saying that God couldn't still use it. And he does. Thank the Lord. I'm not saying the spirit couldn't still work. And he does. Thank the Lord. All his grace and mercy. It's not about our effort. However, he wants us to do our best, just like everybody else. And you can apply that to your situation. You might not be sermon prep, but what is the thing that God has asked me to do? What is the bulk of my work? Again, it doesn't have to be seen as spiritual. All of our work is spiritual if we do it to the glory of God. And that's what we should do. Now, personally, I have some other frogs that are in my routine in the morning as well. I always want to do a, a personal quiet time. I get into scripture and have some prayer. I, I, I usually do that really early before I do anything else, I, I, I usually only have a cup of coffee first and then right away into God's word. I try to have some exercise. I think that's another good thing that if you put it off, at least for me, if I put that off till later in the day, I'm probably not going to do it. And it's the same principle. And I think keeping your body relatively healthy is an important way to serve God as well. And then the, the, the principles of what are the biggest frogs that I have in the week for, for my work life and, and to do those first and to hit them hard. And when you do that, you'll feel so much better off later in the day because you'll feel a relief. So you might not be done with all of the things, but at least you know you get a jump start and, and that you were able to do what you wanted to do. I believe Jesus modeled this, Mark one thirty five is one of many examples where his sort of frog, if you will, was spending time privately with the Heavenly Father in prayer, and he needed to get away with from the crowds and all the disciples, and he would regularly do that. It says he, he would do it very early in the morning. And it says he, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went to a solitary place where he prayed. 
And we see these verses on the regular in the Gospels where Jesus would go to a mountain or a solitary place, always a private, quiet place, by the way, to pray. And he would spend extended hours. And I don't know if you'd call that a frog, but I would, I would see the principle similarly where he, Jesus would do that and he would spend his best part of his day doing that. Admiral McRaven of the United States Navy is well known for a commencement speech that he gave some years ago. And I was just watching this speech on YouTube. You can look it up if you want to. Admiral McRaven commencement speech is what you would search for on YouTube. And he gave the speech to the University of Texas and he started the speech this way. He said, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed. Now, when he said that, it sounds a little extreme, sounds a little absurd, sounds a little silly, sounds a little naive. And actually, when I was watching through the speech, the audience starts cracking up when he says it. They think he's joking. But he keeps a straight face and he keeps going on several different principles that he builds on. It ends up saying, this is what I learned as a Navy SEAL. And when we put these simple practices, sort of eat the frog, do the hard things, put into practice these routines and habits in our lives and do them first thing right in the morning, we started to build a lifestyle of productivity, uh, of work, uh, of doing the right things. And just making our bed was where it all started, where we would get up and we would make our bed and, 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 and then that would lead to uh, other tasks. And all of a sudden we had several tasks completed early in the morning. Now, I'm not saying it has to be make your bed. I just think that's a really interesting take and a good example of what we've been talking about. It's saying that in our li lives that we don't just procrastinate, put things off for the glory of God. We put our work as a priority. We see it as a blessing. We work hard for God. And then we try to make the most of the opportunities. We try to put our time in such a framework that we are maximizing the time that we have on earth. And when we do that, we actually end up with more free time, which is a good thing to rest and recoup and enjoy family and friends, enjoy what God has given us. I think too few of us are actually doing that part well. And we feel really stressed. You hear a message on work and you're like, uh, I don't want to hear that because I'm so busy. Except if we do it well, we won't be. And we'll feel a, a, a lot fresher and more balanced. So that's it for today. I hope that uh, you can put that practice into your life. I've also added a little bit more on the NCC Beyond Sundays podcast, a book I've been reading from Kerry Newhoff, uh, and, and you can see some more of the principles there if you want to listen to that as we try to put that out every Monday morning, bright and early, and you can listen to it on demand throughout the week. Let's pray together one more time. Lord Jesus, thank you for an exciting opportunity you've given us called life. And I pray that each week as we build on the habits we're talking about, refreshing our minds about, or even maybe learning for the first time, we would live a life of adventure and we would really try our best to serve you and honor you. We wouldn't do any of these things in a legalistic way or in a way that just is, is about works, righteousness, but we would do it in grace and love. But we do it with full hearts, enthusiasm, Lord. And I pray specifically that we would be workers for your kingdom. We will put into place really great methods to, to, to be productive, but not just productive, but really having a vocation, a calling to serve you. And not just by working in a church, but in every job that we have, whether it be moms and dads, or whether it be in some business world, or whether it be uh, whatever our everyday work is. Help each one to keep going. Help us to have encouragement today. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks again for being with us. Check out NCC Beyond Sundays. You can find it bright and early on Monday mornings or whatever you want during the week. Listen to it on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And I find it just a great thing to do when I'm taking a walk is to listen to a podcast or doing your laundry or driving to work. Have a great week and we'll see you next Sunday.